So our last speaker in the panel today, it will be Jessica. I uh, will invite her to uh, enter the fray here. Hi, everybody. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, I am Jessica Christine Navedo. Um, I've been studying deep ecology and culture for a very long time and recently have been very invested in exploring uh, business and economics in the ways that it shapes our world. Um, I have a lot of content I'm going to talk through right now. I scrapped my PowerPoint, so bear with me. And um, this is going to go fast. This is a very big domain. Um, economics intersect with every single topic that we've heard today, um, everything that we're talking about and experiencing. Um, it really defines uh, our ability to respond and our resource systems and just the conditions of our world. Um, economics is kind of how we meet the needs of our livelihoods. So we're looking at resource allocation and distribution, uh, how services are available um, and what they look like, who they're available to, um, and it's how we create value. Right now our current dominant economic systems are very based in kind of a created wealth or kind of phantom wealth economies, but those have very tangible effects. This created wealth is how we access uh, resources um, in every aspect of our lives. Um, economics were uh, mentioned, I think, in every single uh, conversation just now, except for John Bowers, which was more biology based. Um, the dominant economic approach right now that is uh, all over the world is neoliberalism, which favors free market and less government regulation. Notice that people in society aren't necessarily included in that statement, which is really interesting since we're dealing with a very, very social dynamic that has very lived uh, impact. Um, through competitive market pressures uh, that seek capital, uh, we see a lot of incredible technological innovation. So this is where medical miracles have come out of. Um, it's how we've harnessed the power of fossil fuels. Uh, we've created all of this infrastructure, digital technologies, and specialization. Um, specialization uh, has, it, it's very characteristic of how we develop. Um, and through globalization, uh, specialization has become more and more dominant and replaced indigenous or traditional uh, locally based economies. Um, and a lot of those types of original ways of being in land or in community uh, were highly adapted and able to meet the needs of the people that lived there. Um, because we're seeing more globalization, specialization, um, communities have less ability to be resilient in response to something like a pandemic. Um, this is also how um, poverty is kind of imported into these developing nations. Um, I know Hillary mentioned how the South is being disproportionately impacted, the global South, um, and she did a great job illustrating how this idea of development and uh, resource acquisition through capitalism, through money exchange is really impacting the necessity for people to take risks that are disproportionately affecting their health and their livelihood. Um, because capitalism's also assessed by economic growth, um, it also requires constant resource extraction, transportation from specialized locations. So we're seeing very vulnerable supply chains and um, just a lot of vulnerability in how we meet the, our livelihoods. Um, the COVID pandemic is a very acute and dire scenario, but it's worsened because of this greater and more abstract crisis that we're in. We have these, uh, these supply systems that are being disrupted very quickly. Um, we're seeing global uh, climate collapse, uh, nuclear war potential. We're constantly living in this kind of a conflict environment, um, and then the erosion of democracy. Um, so this is more like a domino that's falling and initiating a chain reaction into something that's already been set up to collapse. 
um, at very minimum, a recession has been staged for a long time. Um, there's been indicators about a global economic collapse or recession, some kind of disruption for a long time. Um, from an economist perspective, we're seeing massive amounts of debt in every sector, government, private, uh, corporate, uh, and we're seeing a slowdown of global economies. We're using less raw materials, which is great for the planet, bad for the economy, um, contentious politics, just all of these different layers that are indicating some kind of collapse is inevitable. Um, the Asian Development Bank is currently assessing a $4.1 trillion loss in the global economy because of this pandemic. We are going to feel the impact of that for a very, very long time. It takes a huge amount of time for us to recover globally in the way that we have been doing things um, after something like this uh, because of the disruption. We're not going to get back to normal. Um, Dr. James uh, referenced some of the situations that have been primed in the United States previous to the pandemic. So the gutting of government programs like Medicaid, food stamps, uh, the EPA, removal of experts in key positions, uh, inadequate health care, if you have access to health care, um, and this promotion of this competitive us versus them type of dynamic. Um, all of these things make our situation in the states in particular a lot worse, and the response of leadership has been incredibly irresponsible. The United States has the biggest economic system um, in the entire world by an order of magnitude. So when we look at our own economy, it has incredible implications to every single place in the entire on the entire planet because of how our globalized market works. Um, just last week, 6.6 .6 million Americans filed for bankruptcy. So there's just profound impact with um, people's ability to continue to live and thrive and just have basic needs met right now because of this specialization that occurs, because we don't have ability to meet our food needs, meet our um, just all these different needs for the the things that we consume on a daily basis to survive. Um, I have some notes that I'm looking at right now too. Um, Dr. James, I want to bring back into uh, bring some of his content back into this. Um, instead of having a focus on this public health crisis, our government has been very focused on the economic response, um, which has been very interesting. So a lot of the bailouts and things like that that we're seeing are the transportation industry, air travel, um, the oil companies, um, the the response has been incredibly outsourced. You know, we had a presidential uh, release that presented all of these different uh, mega corporation leaders um, as our saviors, right? Uh, it's very interesting because we are in a time of climate collapse and these are the companies and organizations that are fueling that. So because we're in this moment of disruption, it creates a pathway to progress this kind of capitalistic um, corporate agenda um, that is replacing the ability of the government to respond. This is not a government for the people. It is a, a government for private sector industry. Um, the services that we're getting individually, like uh, little payouts, $1,200, things like that, um, they're nice. They help a little, but they're not anywhere close to efficient um, in order to meet our livelihoods. It's just not um, it's not realistic for us to survive this way. Um, that said, economic systems and economic health is how we meet the demands of our livelihoods because of globalization and specialization. So this conversation about how to get our economy back on track is very important. However, um, we need to be privileging and prioritizing um, public health in a way and community resilience in a way that's just not being promoted by our government but can be promoted by our communities and future leadership. Um, as everything's being disrupted in this very, very acute way, uh, my question is, uh, what is the world you want to live in? 
Um, how do we design this so that we do have resilience, so that we can respond to crisis in a way that's not devastating? Um, when we are in a time of just chronic nuclear war potential and we're totally unable to enact um, efficient responses during an epidemic, how do we come to a cohesive unity that creates a path forward um, and ensures an intact biosphere and healthy people? Um, we have enough resources to meet our needs, but we have grossly inefficient systems. What does that mean? How do we redesign, redesign them? This is a design issue. Um, we need solidarity, we need sovereignty, um, and we need to understand how interrelated to our planet and one another uh, we are. Um, I think someone else mentioned the interdependence, I believe it was Hillary, and um, we are highly interdependent creatures and um, understanding that and designing systems in a way that supports that and takes advantage of that is very key in progressing in a way that gives us the ability to respond to um, a forthcoming crisis because we we do have global climate crisis happening. We will have greater epidemics. Um, this is just a practice round. Um, we are being disrupted in a way that gives us a lot of information with how to respond. Um, so in this moment, we're having this disruption and there's all of this potential for change. There's a lot of energy. So think about how we can harness this energy in a way that creates the change um, that we really, really need so to survive as a species. Um, right now, what COVID is teaching us is um, we have a sense of what jobs are really necessary. So support them, uh, value them, pay them really well. Um, we understand the necessity of social safety nets in a way that I don't think we have, at least this generation, has understood before. Um, so this is an election year in the States. We are a world leader. We still are. Um, be engaged. Get involved. Create policy. Um, and it's really important to have this uh, local community activism right now. We're seeing a lot of activated community, people getting food for others, um, doing errands for elderly neighbors. We need more of that. Um, that's an immediate response that does fulfill resource needs. Um, it's very, very important that we continue that even after this crisis. Um, so how can your home, community, city, country, how can we become more resilient through the work and your part participation. Um, and what does Jessica, that mean? Are you, about, are you about ready to wrap up? Yeah, I have just a couple more points. Okay. <laughs> um, and then thinking about how we coordinate across a distance, how do we reallocate resources to where they come or where they need to be in a global scale? Um, how can we take advantage of automation so that um, we can have Kevin referenced disability access and things like that. That's one of the beautiful things about remote work. Um, how can we cultivate remote work and things like that and use our technology to deepen our connections in a way that's not isolating. Um, essentially, we are needing to move our economic systems into a space that really cares about uh, people and our planet um, so that we have resilience to navigate the future. Um, so how are you responding to this wake-up call and what do you need to learn from the situations that we've been navigating through, the solutions that have worked and what hasn't worked? Um, we have a great time to have a little container to assess what really, really matters and work on the what's next as we uh, unite right now and uh, survive this. So. <laughs> Thank you.